Okay, this is a strategic planning for the first quarter. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, we have Wi-Fi, so I'm in a much better mood than I was this morning. Um, I can only imagine. Let me turn this down. I've got Facebook up so that I can watch our comments. We have several participants in our Zoom room. We have a whole training room full of the Denise and Trinowitz team doing their vision boards as we're talking about uh, strategic planning. So super excited about that. We've got some people from uh, um, our Gulf Peaches office in here, and hopefully we'll get a couple more. I got Jack Smith just joined us. All right, let's get started. So what's our agenda for today? So this is first quarter strategic planning. And so we talked a little bit about this this morning. Many of you have a goal. And so I want to go ahead and ask that question. It's going to be a live question in the chat box. Let us know what is your goal for 2021. Now you've got two options. You can either let us know what your goal is for the first quarter, or you can let us know what your annual goal is. If there's a certain amount of income, if there is a certain number of transactions, volume, whatever you have written down, that you've kind of cast as your vision for 2021, go ahead and share that in the chat box or in the comment section of Facebook so that we can manifest that and support that with you. All right, awesome, thank you for doing that. And I am just making, oh, hold on, I'm gonna to try to share this. I, like I said, I left my um, computer in the car. So I'm just sharing it to my page. All right. So today what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to look at a strategic plan for the next for the first quarter, so the next three months, for you to stay on track with the goals that you've set for the year. And what we want to do is introduce to you again, introduce again, some tools that we have talked about over and over and over. Um, and now we are going to just make sure that you understand how to use them and where to find them. So if you have any questions throughout this, please make sure that you are asking. Uh, type it into our Facebook feed or into our Zoom chat room, which I'm gonna pull up the Zoom chat right now. Um, because this is all about you and making sure that you have the right plan for success uh, in that first quarter. Absolutely. So uh, let's see. So Jack said 12,500 per quarter, they want to help 100 plus families. So I'm assuming that that might have been a typo. I'm not quite sure, but give us clarity around the 12,500 per quarter. We've got some answers that are in there. Um, Frank has said 25 closings. Uh, let's see. So, and then we want to gain clarity, right? So Yvette has said 25 closings and 150,000 of income is her goal for, from an annualized perspective. And so Rachel, what we know by actually chunking this down is more often than not, people will say, all right, well, I have 25 closings that I want to do. If I want to divide that by 10 months, then that would be 2.5 as an example. And since there isn't a 0.5 of a transaction, I'm just going to round that up to three. What's the problem when we assume that every single month is equal? Well, right there, we have to take the Pinellas Realtor Organization statistics, and you could look at it from Stellar MLS as well, and National Association of Realtor Statistics. All of them have historical trends for um, sales units and volume per month over many, many, many years. And what we know is that um, sales, the sales numbers aren't stable like per month. So the number of transactions closed in the month of January and February, November and December, or actually October and November, are going to be significantly less than the number of transactions that are closed April, May, June, July, and August. And so with that being said, you know, I, when people have flatlined out their goals like that, I always want them to look at it a little differently and we can talk about it quarterly. So if you wanted to do 12 million in sales, we wouldn't want to do 3 million per quarter because that's flatlined. What we'd want to do is take into consideration that the first quarter and the last quarter are always have fewer transactions. There is a caveat to that though. Several agents work differently throughout the year. And so we have a thing through our Keller Williams reporting system called a multi-year trends report. And all of you guys have access to this. If you've only been with us less than a year, it's not going to do you much good. But if you've been with us for a few years, it, there's a lot of good information in here. 
And so you can go to mykw.kw.com underneath your profile picture, there's a, uh, it says reports, and that's where you can find your multi-year trends report. Look at how, what your trends are. What months do you sell the most in? What months do you not sell? And then think back to like, when are you going on vacation? When are your anniversaries? Uh, you know, when do you get ramped up? When's your anniversary period? Like when's your, when uh, do you roll with your cap? These are all things that will also impact uh, probably how you perform throughout the year. I like to say, Liz, is if we had, uh, Jack did clarify, thank you, Jack, it's 50 million in sales, 12.5 million per quarter. So that's a perfect example of what we're talking about. So instead of saying 12.5 million per quarter, knowing that the first quarter and the fourth quarter are typically lower in volume or units sold, I would recommend taking and saying 10 million the first quarter, 10 million the second quarter, and then um, doing, what would that be? 15 million for the first, for the third and the, for the second and the third quarter. Sorry, that was a lot of numbers and a lot of math <laughs> for my pea brain. Well, and you know, there is, there is a, maybe a little bit of a way of pushing back on that, which is to say your data set, depending on how many transactions you're doing, might not be a large enough data set that's going to be a, that will reflect the National Association of Realtors. Some of our people completely go ham in January because of the activities that they've done over the course of the last four months leading up to this point. So you also have to look at yourself. Do you take off for a certain amount of time in the summer where you go to your lake house and you spend time with family? The likelihood of you actually having more transactions when the rest of the curve is might not actually be a direct reflection of your business because your activities might be skewed a little bit. So understanding if you don't have your own trend, that's why Rachel's showing you the National Association of Realtor trend and the Pinellas trend uh, to know seasonality, but also know your seasonality. I'm a perfect example of someone who normally takes the last bit of December off. By taking the last bit of December, there are certain things that I have to play catch up in the month of January, which means that January is usually a little bit of a lighter month for me than other months. So just taking some of those things into consideration, also knowing when you have those things scheduled is very important. We plan to take a trip in May. Well, what's going to happen around May also will have to do with the activities as we get a little bit further looking at something that we use, which is a 411. You know, if I have a commitment that I wanna do six open houses a month, and I know that I'm going to be gone one of those weekends, then I need to know that I'm fitting those, those six open houses between three weekends and not four. So it's very important for you to gain clarity around your goals and then the activities that we need to do in order to get there. Just quick question, Michael, when are you leaving in May? And where are you going? That's just an example. Okay, because I want to go out of the country in May, so we need to talk. I, I wanted to go, well, we wanted to go to Italy in May. Uh, however, I don't think that that's going to be happening because of COVID. Um, so, you know, it's definitely those things, but it's important. Oftentimes people forget, oh yeah, you know, my cousin's getting married and we've got to go, you know, it's the third weekend of January. You completely forgot about it and you've built a 411, you've built a plan and then now we have to make some adjustments because we didn't take the time to plan accordingly. Well, and here's another thing to consider too, Michael. Like if you don't have any closings scheduled for January already, are you going to have three closings in January? No. No. So <laughs> that's another way that you can use the concept of the 10-month year is that's February through November, right? right? But if you plan it from February through November, will you ever have closings in January? Probably not. Probably not. So that's, that's something to take into consideration. Another thing that I've, uh, um, kind of a pattern I've seen throughout the years of coaching top agents is that January comes and it is, I was going to use a, a phrase that I won't, so now I did, uh, gung-ho, sorry, I was like, <laughs> what's a replacement phrase? It's gung-ho, jets burning, running, run, 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 run. You guys are trailblazing, you're making things happen, you're taking listings, you're lead generating, you're showing properties, you're writing contracts, you're doing open houses, it's like just so much stuff going on. You can't sustain that 
for too long of a period of time. And so what I always see is like this ramp up for the first, say, three to four months and then whew. So you need to strategically plan some breaks as well. Um, so but the thing I love about the concept of breaking it out into quarters, which we talk about, is it keeps us from annualizing, which also has an impact on how, how we perceive timing. So we, we sometimes think, oh, well, I want to do, you know, 20 million in sales or 10 million in sales this year, and it's March and we're not on track, but hey, we still got nine months to go. And so uh, that, that perception of time kind of gets lost when we uh, annualize our goals. Um, so it, it does help to just say, okay, well, if I'm going to be on track for my goals, I need to do this in the first quarter. And that allows us after that first quarter to really look, work, did we do the right activities? Are we on track? What needs to change? What needs to be adjusted? What do I need to do different? Right. And so because of the fact that this is a a strategic planning session. This isn't just a lecture or uh, a class. I really want you to go ahead and look at the annual goal that you had set out. There's a number that you had put in the comment section or that you have in front of you and say, all right, out of that number, what am I committed to achieving by the end of quarter one? And so the end of quarter one would be by the end of March. So we would say effectively, by April 1st, you expect to have this completed. It's a certain number of transactions or it is a certain level or percentage of completion that you've identified. So go ahead, once you have that figured out, go ahead and put that in the comment section so that you know what you're committed to in the first quarter. And with that, I also wanna ask, and so guys, if you are in here in Zoom or on Facebook, if you're not putting this stuff in the chat box, then um, there's a likelihood you won't get as much information out of this. So play along with us. This is an interactive workshop style. Um, I also want you guys to think about what is one strategy, just one, that you know that you have to build a habit for in that first quarter. Thank you, Jack, for playing along. Uh, Aaron's got three. Uh, Frank put, uh, I think that was from earlier, put 25 closings. So what's one strategy you have to implement in the first quarter in order to be on track to hit your goal? I'm waiting for some answers there. Right. Or and, and so maybe for some people, it is that they want to be communicating with their sphere, something that they haven't done in a while. And so first and foremost, that would be if, if sphere is the strategy or sphere communicating with your sphere is the way that you want to move, then the question would be, what do I have to do with my database in order to get it to a certain place? So I might set a goal that I need my database to be complete by January 15th. That is my number one priority so that I can be effectively communicating with my sphere for that first quarter. And Frank gave holding open houses. So specifically, how many open houses would you like to hold on a monthly basis in order for you to achieve your goal of closing three transactions by April 1st? Um, and, and Frank, just to clarify, is that close three by April 1st or is that three per month? Just want to clarify that to make sure that we're on the same page. Jack Smith said lead generate every day and Tucker Kemp said having 10 conversations about real estate every day. And this is where I want to talk to you guys about the 411. And if you're not using a 411, it is nothing more than a piece of paper. And it's like the most valuable piece of paper I've ever been introduced to. Um, we actually had an ALC masterminds around this um, this morning about who was using and who wasn't and the benefits of it. So I like the 411 because it allows us to score our activities on a weekly basis. And then we can also score our activities on a monthly basis instead of waiting for the quarter. So Jack, you put lead generate every day, nine to 11. Frank, you're talking about doing open, holding open houses. So what I'm, what I'm referring to as the score is like the activity is lead generating or holding open houses. What is the result that you want out of that? so that you can keep score on a weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis. If we're holding open houses and only having two or three people come to it, is it are we being as effective as we can be? If we're lead generating from nine to 11 and having you know, five great conversations, but it didn't get the listing appointments or buyer appointments that we were wanting, 
is it the most effective strategy? So that's why I love the 411 tool to be able to look at it on a weekly basis to understand how to tweak it. Yeah, and, and so I'm gonna show a very, it's uh, apparently the scanner does not like pencil, so I apologize, but I'm just gonna show you oh, a quick right. visual, yeah. We have a mock one in Drive that I can pull up real quick. And while you're doing that, so just to show, I do want one of the things that's a little different with this one to show you, right? is in the month of January, my goal is three closings. I need to do five agreements, nine appointments for 27,000 in gross commission income. What's here is you can see that my number one priority is appointments, you can barely see it. But the idea here is that you're able to see how many appointments did I set, how many appointments did I go on, and how many appointments actually converted to an agreement, where they came from. And so what I wanted to show, and this is where you can show the mock-up is, down here at the bottom, if I have a goal like Frank of doing open houses and I've got six that I want to do, you can actually see that from 123 Main Street, we had eight people come through and this arrow is pointing that Steve and Claudia actually came from my open house. So in a year's time, this idea of when you're working with a coach, a coach is able to go in and go, fantastic, where did your business come from is a question that we're going to ask over and over and over again. So as Rachel said, what is the goal? I don't care if one person came to your open house if the one person turns into an appointment. I don't care if 37 people come through an open house and you are asking questions that get you an answer like, yep, yeah, no, we're working with an agent, so just leave or us alone, please. if 37 people came to your open house, you never put them in your database or followed up. What's the point? Can you exactly. make me post and I'll show mine? Yep. And so this idea of utilizing the, uh, the 411 is a really great way of saying, where are my activities yielding my results? I can see where did my, my appointments come from? Where did my, uh, my number of contacts come from? Where do my activities, are they yielding me the results that I'm looking for or not? And so this is one that we used back in October when we did business planning. And uh, it's just a, oh, I probably need to make it a little bigger because that's always something that people request. And it's not making it bigger. Sorry, guys. Give me just a sec. Here we go. All right. So what this does is you're going to put... You're going to put your monthly goal, what have you identified as what you need to achieve this month in order for you to be on track for your annual goal. And then we're going to look at the week. What are the priorities for the week? In this example, 411, I know that I want to have five appointments per week. We can actually get a little bit more in detail with this as you continue to build on it and say, okay, are those five listing appointments or five buyer appointments? Or am I a new agent and these are just me, this is me getting in the habit of just scheduling appointments and they can be with anybody. Um, but uh, so as you schedule the appointments, you're, you're writing them in. And so if the goal was five listing appointments this week or five buyer appointments or a mixture, um, and let's say that you got four of them, then we got four out of the five. So what is that, 80%? Uh, and if I was to give you a grade school score, you would be at a B, right? Um, so that way you can actually look at, okay, so I only got four out of my five. What do I need to change in order to make sure that I'm hitting my five? Because I, I know I have to hit my five in order to be on track for my goal. Another really cool thing that I've talked to a lot of agents about, and I'll just stop sharing right here, um, is that they use this tool, they keep them, and then they go back through them to see who they've had appointments with that they didn't close. Right. So that allowed that um, one of our agents called this couch change. And I just love that, uh, that idea of it's the customer that fell through the cracks of your couch and you lift the cushions up and there's all this money in there. Well, that's also like if you're keeping track of who you actually go on appointments with, you can go back through your past 411s and look at it and say, oh, God, I forgot to follow up with that person. Call them. Yeah. You know? Well, the other thing that's really great, and that's where you'll see next to those appointments, sometimes people will use symbols, and this is something that we do of, okay, if I put someone down next to the number, that means that the appointment was set. 
if I put a check mark next to the, the name or next to the number, then that means that there's an appointment that I've gone on. And then if I circle the name, then that means that I've taken the actual agreement. And so I'm able to look at it. It seems completely antiquated, but this idea of do I need to set five appointments to get to my goal or do I need to go on five appointments to get on to my goal? Because if I'm only giving myself five slots, but I need to go on five appointments, which probably means that I need to schedule seven because people no call, no show. People have life things that happen in which we need to reschedule. So these are some of the things that show up where getting really critical and going and saying, you know, it's one of the things that we have conversations all the time is people might feel like they're being grilled because we ask these questions. Well, what's your conversion rate? Oh, I don't know my numbers. I don't track any of those things. Okay. Well, this very simple piece of paper, just by doing a little check mark, doing a little circle, looking at the amount of appointments that I've set to the appointments that I've gone on, to the appointments that I actually go on and then get the agreements, I now can know my personal conversion rate, not just what the, the red book tells me or, or what someone else has just kind of prescribed as a blanket number. Knowing your business, not just business, is one of the most critical things that you can do for your own growth. Well, and you know, I mentioned this this morning on Reading Red, going back through and rereading uh, Four Disciplines of Execution. The thing I wrote down is we we know what we want to achieve. The what is you know three transactions by April first or twelve point four five million per quarter, helping a hundred families. Uh, Julie says uh, committed to seven transactions by April. We know the what, it's the how that typically throws us off. And so the, the strategies that we're talking about, a simplified piece of paper where you're writing down your appointments, you're tracking your results, you're scoring yourself, these are the how. These are the actual day-to-day -day action steps, the, the, the activities that you have to do in order to get to that what. And this is the part that, you know, we love at entrepreneurs are very idealistic where we just want to create big ideas and theories and then hope, pray and meditate that it shows up. But these are the actual step by step action steps to get there. And so, Rachel, you know, you had asked Julie, Julie had said what her goal was for the first quarter. You had asked, do you know how many people you need in your pipeline in order to achieve your goal? You know, that's the idea of we have, we have those conversations all the time where people are like, oh, I'm working with like 18 leads right now. I mean, these buyers are just coming out of the woodwork and I go fantastic. Out of those 18, how many of them do you believe you're going to get a paycheck in the next 30 days? Mm, probably like two. Okay. How many of them do you think you're going to get a paycheck within the next 60 days? Uh, maybe like mm, five more. Okay. So besides those seven, put the other 11 on a pipeline, put them on a smart plan, check in with them from time to time, but you are not actually working with 18 buyers at this moment in time. You're actually working with two and you're queuing up another five. This way for people is what we oftentimes refer to as putting people in buckets of, I've got my A buyers, my B buyers, and my C buyers, same thing with my sellers. You don't have enough time and as Rachel said, Agents will go full ham from January through June and then just die. And it's because of this concept that I have 18 buyers. I have 36 leads. I've got all these leads that come through Facebook. I got to work with all of them right now. Oh my goodness. Am I going to slow down and prioritize and say, wait a minute. If I was to look at what I have in front of me, what are the ones that if I was only to make 10 phone calls today in order to pay my mortgage this month, who are the 10 most meaningful people that have the probability of making a move? And that again is where we prioritize the activities of, am I calling my best friend every day thinking that I'm being busy or am I calling the people that I need to, that's going to get me closer to my goal? Yeah. And it's just clarity on the action steps. So for Julie, you know, with the goal of seven closings by April 1st, well, right there, we know we need seven hot, ready, capable buyers, right? We know we need a bare minimum of seven. 
Um, but what I would do is just double it. And I'd say, I want 14 with a 50% fallout chance, meaning they couldn't find a home. They decided not to move. They didn't relocate or they couldn't get the mortgage. The inspection didn't come out and didn't appraise. All the things that actually happen in our real estate world, but maintaining a pipeline of, of twice what you actually have to have ensures that you have the cushion that you need to hit your goal. And so I do the same thing. Like my goal, I have a goal of 20, what I call tens, meaning they're going to join us this month. I want to maintain 20 tens per month. So I know at the end of December, I looked and I had 12. So I, my goal for January is to add eight tens to my pipeline. That gives me clarity around it. Cause I'll be honest, there are some people on there. I'll put us tens and I'm a hoping, right? I'm hoping the stars align so that they, they do show up. So um, I think that having that cushion, but I think going through those activities that way also helps. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're looking at the activities that you need to do in order to get there, whether it's three closings, seven closings, six closings, 12 and a half million in volume, going and looking back and saying, all right, well, if I was to look at my business previously, what was the percentage of my business? Where did it come from? If you go and you look and 70% of your business came from Sphere and 10% came from open houses and then everything else was kind of single digits of where they came from, what would be the number one activity that you should be focused on in terms of making sure that you get to your seven closings by the end of March? It would be your fear. Right. Yeah. So for the person who goes, but it's 2021, it's a new year. I'm committed to farming. Yes. And I love that. And you have seven closings that you want to achieve within the next 90 days. Where do we know that if where, where's the well that we've known, if we go there, we can get a bucket of water and we can make sure that our family is hydrated is very different than I'm also going to go out and look for a new area that I'm able to dig a well and see if there's some water. Yeah, it's just like what I've been saying, Michael. It's a new year, but we entered it with all the same stuff that we left the last one with. We have the same skill set. We have the same habits. We have the same subconscious. Like We haven't changed, nor do we change that quickly. And so we can expect something new and different out of this year if we're not doing anything consistently over time to become new and different. Right. And that, you know, the 12 week year, that's one of the things I love about it. It's like, what habit do you need to form in order for you to hit your goal and look at habit stacking, building that one habit over the first 12 weeks. So that's my question to all of you guys who are participating in this. What is the habit that you need to build in order for you to hit your goal? What's the habit that you would like to have, like to have that you know is solid, it's foundational? What's the habit that you need? Well, and Jack has put on here, you know, daily lead generation. Julie had said 25 real estate conversations per week, right? So again, this idea that, you know, that also gives you an opportunity to have a little bit of flexibility, right? When someone says, I'm going to do, I'm going to do an open house every single weekend, every single weekend. Yeah. Every single weekend. Okay. Is anything causing you to have to leave town anytime soon? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I've got to go to Atlanta. I've got to go to my cousin's wedding on the third weekend, but besides that weekend, every single weekend. Okay. Is anybody having a birthday that you're doing any kind of celebration of the well, yeah, okay, in May we normally, so then maybe we go back and we say, instead of I'm going to do we, uh, open houses every single weekend, you set a goal on a monthly basis to say, I'm going to do six open houses, or I'm going to do four open houses, or I'm going to do eight open houses. And again, if I know that on the third weekend, it's blacked out because I have other commitments, then I also know that there is a relationship. It's also a conversation with your family. Hey, listen, I'm not going to be available three of the four weekends. Let's make that fourth weekend amazing, but know that for the first three weekends leading up to that, I have a prior commitment. When we're able to find this balance, it also is going to make sure that you don't get burnt out 
and that we don't have resentment from other people in our worlds that are not necessarily understanding a balance of the integration between work and life. Here's, here's, the, here's the tried and true test, I think, to determine if your strategy is clear enough, is that you can communicate it to somebody else and they could actually do it. So it, what I mean by that is, well, try it on somebody, first of all. Um, and then, so if you guys don't mind, you know, type in here, um, is your strategy clear enough that you could, that is documented and you could teach somebody else to do it? Um, and so what I mean by that is, okay, twin, uh, six open houses a month or three open houses a month. So if I go do three open houses a month, was the goal three open houses? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's that becomes the question. Yeah, so get get clear on that, guys. Like um, <laughs> Julie says, no exclamation point. Then Julie, that's where I'd say dig in a little deeper. I mean, really go micro with this stuff and and just start saying, okay. So if I needed to show somebody else how to do it. Where are the gaps? What am I missing? And until we, we stop and dissect and look in to our strategy, I don't think that we know how to do it. Yeah, well, and so to that point, is it a win? We kind of talked about this this morning. Is it a win that you do three open houses and no one shows up? Is it a win that you add five people to your database per open house? Is it a win that you have five conversations per open house, which also includes door knocking? It also includes social media advertising about your open house. It also includes putting out signs. It also includes picking up signs because more of y'all get stopped picking up signs than anything else. And at the actual open house. Especially those with short skirts and heels. <laughs> yeah. JK, JK. I mean, it'd be really awkward for me in short skirts and heels, but I'll try it if it's a strategy that I'll get. <laughs> I think it would, it would definitely uh, stop me. Yeah. But, you know, this, this concept of saying that's a very different, my, my game play, my strategy is going to be very different if my goal is to hold an open house per weekend versus to have five conversations per open house that I do, it's going to absolutely change the activities and the response that I have of where I'm gonna get those answers. Because to a certain extent, the actual you know two hours that you're doing that open house from 12 to two, if nobody shows up and I don't have any conversations, is that a win? And am I okay with those results? Or am I gonna go out into the community and find five conversations? Well, Jason Weatherington says short skirts and heels would work in Wilton Manors for you, Michael. And I know what I love Wilton Manors. <laughs> oh, so Jason, is that going to be one of your strategies? I'm just going to ask. Um, well, we, we have identified a new farming area for Jason. So that might be a way for him to uh, get a few people. <laughs> and Sheva had put in our chat room here that, um, you know, her... Um, her goal is five solid conversations a day. So I ask, you know, what's the goal with five solid conversations? And uh, she responded and said five appointments per week for 250,000 annual goal. Now, this is, this is what I'm talking about. This is where I'm saying, keep digging in, keep digging in, keep digging in. Because I'm going to say, what type of appointments do you have to have per week? Are they listing appointments or buyer appointments? How many do you have to have for buyers and how many do you have to have for sellers in order for you to get to your goal? And are they qualified buyers? Are they qualified sellers? And then we dig in a little deeper and say, okay, so let's say you're going on three listing appointments per week, but you're only getting two listings a month. Then, so is it the appointment? Is it the listing appointment? Is it the consultation? Like always looking and scoring and that's the beauty of using the 411 is you can go in and say okay these are the activities i've done these are the results i've gotten these are the things i know that i need to implement in order to increase my conversion rate to get me a higher um, percentage of listings from the appointments that i've gone on so that i can get closer to my goal 
Right, because there's a very big difference between, hey, I saw your name on my phone and made me think of you. How are you? Let's go grab lunch. We go grab lunch. And then you pull out a listing agreement after salad and the person on the other side is like, what's happening? Oh, well, don't you know I'm in real estate? I thought if we were getting lunch that you were going to sell your house. I just thought we were going to get lunch is very different than having a conversation with someone that, and I ask the question, hey, now before I see you on Saturday, let me ask you this. If what I say makes sense, are you going to be ready and willing to sign paperwork when I see you on Saturday? Is a very different expectation of an appointment than, and this is what some people do all the time. Oh, I'm going to go and preview this for sale by owner's house. And then they bring a listing agreement with them and they bring their Vanna White presentation and then they don't understand why their conversion rate is not 100% or 80% or even 50%. Are we setting clear expectations first with ourselves and then with the people that we're having appointments with? Yeah, it, it's so fascinating how, you know, what I did and I've shown this to you is I created the coaches uh, scoreboard or playbook. And what I did was I went into the, so we have three aspects of our business. We have recruiting, productivity, and operations, right? Or profitability. And I, and I dug into those and said, what are the key factors that impact recruiting? What are the key factors that impact productivity? What are the key factors that impact our operations and profitability? And then I looked at those and I said, how can we, how can we score these on a monthly and quarterly basis to see if we're even doing the right activities? Are these really the most important key factors? And so that's what my challenge to you guys would be is say, okay, what are the key factors that are going to impact your success? And please don't put lead generate. And the, why do I say don't put lead generate? Why do you think, Michael? Well, for me, leads don't pay my mortgage. Clients pay my mortgage. So that's probably the biggest part, right? You know, you having a lot of leads does not necessarily mean that those people are ready, willing, and able to do anything today. Right. And we just get in the habit of speaking in this ambiguous language of lead generate. Like, what the hell does that mean? Like, what specifically are you going to do? And are you clear on it? Like so many of us know, well, I know I got a lead generate. Okay, well, so what, what'd you do today? Well, I followed my fingernails. I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> we gotta get- Rachel, you, you know, you've heard me tell this over and over and over again, and I'll do it one more time and I'll probably do it for the next 50 years. We hear people go, I lead generate for three hours a day, every single day. Fantastic. Well, if Rachel and I both go to the gym and I walk very slowly on the treadmill for 20 minutes and then spend the remaining two hours and 40 minutes eating a bag of Doritos watching her exercise. But I say, listen, I go to the gym every day for three hours a day. Am I going to have a different set of results than Rachel will? Do not mistake movement for achievement. Do not mistake lead generating for two hours because I watch you. You get set up, it's nine o'clock, you're ready to lead generate. You make one phone call, someone answers and they didn't reject you. You now go do a victory lap in the entire building to let any person who will listen that you had a conversation with somebody. At this point, it's now 9.20 and you pick up the phone again. Then you go, oh man, I'm out of, out of drink. I need to go to the kitchen. So you go to the kitchen and then you go and you fill up your coffee or you do whatever and you see Miss Kathy or you go and you see someone else and then you have a 35 minute conversation you come back in, it's now 10.05, you make one more conversation, you had five calls in two hours, you go, but I lead generated for two hours. Yeah, because the goal wasn't, the goal isn't lead generating, that's not the key activity. Right. It's, it's scheduling appointments, it's going on appointments, and that was something fun this morning that happened was, uh, we were talking at uh, one of the ALC masterminds, and I was talking about the 411, and my goal is five appointments per week and I haven't clarified but I hadn't clarified are they scheduled or held right. and and you know I, I'm, I we're teaching this and and the reason we're teaching this is because it's not that easy like you can keep digging in and digging in I mean I've been teaching this for a very long time we've been teaching this together for a very long time and still I caught myself without clarity on the goal 
Absolutely. On the result. It wasn't clarity on the goal. It was clarity on the result I wanted. So before we keep going, I do want to get some feedback. Let's get some, what are you hearing around the activities that you schedule, the language that you're using, and the way that you intend to take this to paper on strategizing over your first quarter? Please go ahead and put that in the comment section. We really want to hear it from you um, because obviously we can talk about this for a very long time. We do not have that much time left because this was scheduled for an hour. And we do want to make sure that you are actually learning for earning sake, not just watching two people banter. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I'm specified the action steps and keep track. That's what you want us to do, Aaron. That's what you want no, no. us to do. No, that's what he's getting as as oh, okay. clarity from what we're doing. Guys, I, this is not easy. And it takes time. Like it takes, you've got to carve out some time out of your day, out of your morning or your evening or your weekend. You need to sit down and deep dive into this. What is the actual result from the activities that you want to see? And how are you going to get to that result? How are you going to track it? How are you going to stay on track with it? I mean, those are all the things that are going to determine the success of your plan. But you've got to get really specific. I mean, when I'm talking about getting to a piece of paper that you carry around with you for your priorities of the week, that's how minute I'm talking about getting and we talk about this often. So this document being next to you, that, you know, I set a goal. As, as Julie said, she set a goal of having 25 real estate conversations per week. Then by Sunday, right, she would go back to her 411 and she would say the goal was 25. What was the actual? She would go and she'd look at the open houses that she'd held and she'd say, okay, how many people came to the open houses? Did any appointments come from those open houses? And then now that it's Sunday, I'm going to go ahead and take about 30 minutes and I'm going to plan my next week. Let me look at my 411 and say, what were some of the tasks that I have for the week of the 11th through the 17th? Are there any classes that I have intended to make sure that I'm a part of that's on my calendar so that I can grow as a business owner? Are there any activities? Do I need to finalize my postcard because I want those to go out and be delivered by the 1st of February and I haven't even started the design. The tool of the 411 as, as Jack put on there, the acronym of KISS is keep it simple, stupid, right? Like if I can't put it on a simple piece of paper, a one page paper that I can then actually show to my coach or show to someone who can hold me accountable. And I think that that is probably one of the biggest pieces that is missing in this conversation is it doesn't matter if it's annualized or if it's biannual or if it's quarterly without accountability, a lot of this is going to fall to the wayside because no person is disciplined. You have moments of discipline, yet there is no one person who is disciplined 100% of the time. And I just want to say on that, keep it simple, silly, because I don't want to call anybody stupid, but keep it simple, silly. Honestly, guys, it's not that simple. It's, it's, it's difficult to keep diving in, diving in, diving in, diving in, diving in until you find where you need to focus. That's where the simplicity lies, but there's a lot of digging to get there. Right. And that part is the, that's the not simple or the more difficult piece of it is continuing to push back those layers until you get to the foundational piece of the activities the results that you want, the goals that you set to get you to your, the success that you desire. Right. And so what is the environment or who are the people that surround you that can help you as you are moving through your first quarter and you're moving through your strategic planning and going, you know what, it's week four, it's week five, and I'm not achieving the things that I put on my calendar Maybe I need to pivot. Maybe I need to re-strategize or reprioritize. Who is in your world or what in your environment is going to allow you to have those conversations over and over and over again so that you don't go down a path for too long before you realize that you are miles off track of the original goal? 
Well, and what's great about that, Michael, is today at two o'clock, like following this, uh, Kristen Agan has a coaching group every week at two o'clock. Uh, she's added, she's going to add the link into the Facebook feed. Uh, it's um, for you guys. So um, you can see it there. So if you want to take what we're talking about today and take it into a coaching group and dissect it a little bit more, that's an opportunity. You have one at three o'clock. So normally mine actually happens during this time. So awesome. I have I have a coaching session that happens this time. And then our business coaches, we meet on Thursdays at two o'clock. But, you know, the point is, is that there are an abundance of coaching sessions. Please feel free to reach out to Kristen. Reach well, out to and I have, reach yeah, out. I, I have mine every Thursday at three o'clock. Kristen has hers every Tuesday at two o'clock. Guys, jump in here. Take advantage of the coaching, the accountability, the tools, the resources that you have in abundance around you. And there's always an opportunity for, uh, for you to be able to reach out. If there is ever where you need a little specificity on your specific business plan, do reach out to any one of us. We will absolutely take the time to have a consultation, a real quick overview. Even if it's not a formal one-on-one -on -one sit down, you can absolutely send your GPS you can send your 411 over and more than happy to ask some clarifying questions to really help you dig down to say, what are the things that are going to have the most movement for you on this week or the activities that you can do to get closer to your goals? Yeah. Um, so Kristen did put her link in here in the feed. And I'm just going to ask, because we, we, I mean, really, we're talking strategies. We're talking tools, resources. We talked the 411. We talked about really diving into um what you had identified as the activities to get you to where you want to go and then how to dig into those a little farther. What questions do you guys have? Or do you even know what questions to ask? Like take, take the opportunity. You have Michael and I here right now, or maybe you want to wait and get into the coaching group where it's more of a meeting space. But what questions do you have that we can help you with right now for your strategies for the first quarter? And a, a cool piece to this, as you guys are thinking about the questions and you're typing them in, um, at the end of the third quarter, we're going to have another session like this. So make sure that you come back at the end of the third quarter so we can do a third, uh, first quarter. Sorry, I said third. At the, at the end of the first quarter, we're going to have a first quarter review so we can help you go back and look at what you've done. We'll do that more of a meeting room style so that we can have more interaction. Yeah. And, and so... You know, it's definitely one of those where, you know, we're waiting if there are any questions. If there are not any questions, we also understand that some of this requires you to do the activities, kind of to go away, put this to paper, find areas where you kind of move a little bit quicker. You might have some roadblocks in other places and come back. So that was part of the reason as to why this was done in this format as well. You know, really kind of a flash hit in 50 minutes or so of, of information that can be helpful. But I hope that you realize that the tools that you use, they don't have to be some expensive program. It doesn't have to be some custom app. It doesn't have to be a lot of these things. It's going to be the tool that you use that shows you, do I have a pulse on my business? Do I have a pulse on my performance? And if I've been either A, avoiding those conversations or just completely been naive to how to track those things or the importance of tracking them, make it a goal in 2021 that you are going to take to a piece of paper like the 411. Um, I mean, it's really one of our favorite tools and be able to utilize this to say, all right, after two or three months, I can start to see my habits. I can see my trends. And we're able to look at that document and very quickly be able to diagnose and prescribe the best path forward to get you closer to the activities that you need to do to hit your goal. Yeah. Well, Michael, I'm not seeing any questions pop up. And I think that we've uh, dug into this enough. So we should give them time. I will tell you that when I went through the activity for our three market centers, our leadership team, um, in those three key areas, I found two big gaping ho holes. And so I, you know, and I'm glad I found them. I have two huge holes that need to be filled. Right. And I could have just dove into the year, into my activities, into my world, and not known that those were there. And now I can put together a plan to fill those, or to bridge those gaps, which wouldn't have happened if I didn't dive in and actually, you know, 
really think about what I want to accomplish. Right. Absolutely. And that man, thanks for being on here. She said, led me to success at KW and you didn't respond to my uh, request for dinner Thursday evening, Annette. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Again, we will make sure that if you don't already have it, that you have the conversation or that you have our contact information. Feel free to reach out to uh, either of us as well as Kristen, uh, who is on here and who has her coaching group at two o'clock. Um, we That's why we're here, truly. I mean, it's really from that perspective of being able to help you uh, take these tools, take the things that you're learning. There's so much training at Keller Williams that sometimes it feels like I don't necessarily know how do I apply or what's the most important thing. I think Rachel, you and I would agree that the 411 is definitely up there and probably the top one or two tools that we have that we use that has a direct correlation to our success. So. Yeah, I'll just say anytime I feel like life is hectic or running fast, it's just moving too fast around me and I'm not keeping up, it's because I haven't done my 411. I, I definitely rank it as number one for me. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, really, for, for being in here. Uh, it's so important to us that you are gathering information and utilizing it for your, for your own business and financial success and health. And I uh, just love that you're here and participating. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.